I have to say I'm thrilled to have my exhibition on ranch women here at the Idle George, and particularly during women's uh, the month of March, which is honoring women. So I'm so happy for that because these women told me at one point, they said, thank you for giving us a voice. So I feel very pleased with that. <clears throat> I have to state that my mother is the one who gave me the idea of photographing ranch women. I have just finished a piece on Johnny Jonkowski, a Montana gal who's two-time world champion women's bull rider. And I'd done it for People magazine, but they rejected it. I don't know if it was because the photographs were black and white or because the writing was not good enough. I don't know. So I was bemoaning this to my mother and she said, why don't you photograph French women? And I thought, yes, why don't I photograph French women? And so I was off and running on that subject. And it took me about three years to finish all of the photography. Then, of course, came all the work of deciding what images I was going to take from all of the work I did. And I interviewed each woman. Sometimes the interviews were three hours long, sometimes five hours long. And I still have those interviews. Most of it was transferred to paper. <clears throat> and I want to give the tape recordings, and that's how I made them, tape recordings, to the various state historical libraries that uh, each woman lived in. Um, and the other thing was my father had written a book and uh, it was about growing up in Montana on a ranch. He knows how to tell a story. And so everybody who ranched seemed to know the name Spike Van Cleve. His given name was Paul Ledger Van Cleve III, but he was known as Spike. Um, and so I would call up people and uh, ranchers, ranch women, and um, they would say, do you know, do you, are you related to this man named Spike Van Cleve who wrote this book? And I said, yes, that's my dad. Well, that was carte blanche. They opened the doors to the ranch. They were so glad that I would come and photograph them, the women. Um, what is this? That doesn't belong there. Whoops. I did something. <laughs> I'm tech challenged. I got to put my hands down until I'm ready to look at a photograph. At any rate, I photographed these women by word of mouth. One woman would say, oh, you've got to go photograph so-and-so. So I would call this other woman and uh, see if I thought I should photograph her. And it was word of mouth from Canada to Mexico, but in the Rocky Mountains. So without further ado, let me start with these photographs. This is <clears throat> three women, all related, the grandmother on the right, the granddaughter in the middle. And now to back, go back to this, the grandmother, then the granddaughter, and then the daughter. They're all Mormons. They are ranching. Nina Robinson here, Sharon Lusco, and then Celeste Holmes in the middle. Uh, they were ranching in some pretty hard country outside of a little town in south, mm, southern Utah. Very pretty country in terms of colored rocks and earth, but tough land to make a living ranching. A delightful family. Whoa. 
I've got to get to the rest of my oh, picture here so I can pull up the next image. I don't know why this is such a problem this time. Okay. This is a woman who ranches in uh, Arizona, Congress, Arizona. <clears throat> she bought her cattle down in Mexico. They were pretty thin, scrawny cattle. She'd bring them up to her area in Arizona, fatten them up, and then sell them. Now, her husband wasn't interested in ranching at all, but she loved it. And she hired the two men kind of behind her, these vaqueros, Mexican vaqueros, to take care of the cattle, watch them, because the creek that runs through there, or creek that runs through there, has a lot of quicksand. And they didn't want to lose cattle by having them get bogged down and then sucked down into quicksand. So uh, Ella Dean did this, and she had, uh... <laughs> you've got to look at her belt buckle here. You see it? It's spelling B-O-S-S, -S, boss. <laughs> she meant it. She really was the boss. But as she has a wonderful smile on her face, she is such a good-natured, um, funny, wonderful person. But you know, all of these women were. They were charming, hardworking, um, no nonsense, but charming also. Then we move on here to a young woman down in Texas, uh, not too far from Big Bend. So it's really West Texas where they still are working cattle and, and riding horses, not doing it with ATVs and all of that kind of stuff. She, uh, her father owned the ranch. She had married a veterinarian, but he had given up uh, his career to be on the ranch and they have taken over the ranch and <clears throat> here she was newly married, newly pregnant. And uh, I saw her about a year ago down in Phoenix at an event called Art of the Cowgirl, roping, riding, cutting, um, all of that kind of thing. And she had clearly matured into a strong, strong woman that that happens they take over they have to run it and they do here's the woman in northern new mexico gretchen samus <clears throat> excuse me and the reason i photographed gretchen in the kitchen is because of the old time stove you see it there with the you can see a part of the coffee pot on. Can you see that if I use this pointer here? Okay. You can see that she had cranked up the wood burning stove for heat in the early morning because this was pretty much in the mountains in northern New Mexico outside of a town called Cimarron. And then she'd taken a break to come in for lunch and she had heated soup on the stove and was doing a, a cheese sandwich in the oven there. Now, she's a college-educated woman. She had come back to take over her grandparents' ranch. She loved it. She loved ranching. She's a no-nonsense kind of person and a real hand on horseback. This case, well, here you see Gretchen again 
working, these bales weigh anywhere from 75 to 95 pounds. And a woman doesn't have the same upper body strength that a man does. And they, as in Gretchen's case, she broke down early at 80, I think 82 or 83, and she just had to give up. She couldn't do the ranch work anymore. She had a hired hand, but it's very important for somebody like Gretchen to be out there doing the work, not just assigning it to be done by a hired man. And her dog, Mr. <laughs> is supervising the entire operation. Oh, I want to move this over a little bit. There we are. This is a case of a rancher that I know very well up here in Montana. You can see that uh, she's not all concerned about wearing nice, clean, uh, new jacket. She's a working person. You look at the flank cinch here, the back cinch. She's got it snugged right up. So if she ropes anything, that that will not pull a saddle horn into the horse's neck and hurt the shoulders of the horse. That's what can happen, unfortunately, and will happen sometimes. Uh, she's clearly a dally roper, meaning she will wrap the end of the rope around the horn when she catches something. Now, she's got all her fingers, and most dally ropers are going to be missing a thumb or a finger because when that rope tightens up immediately as you're doing the dally, taking the loops around the horn, uh, if you've got a finger in the way, it's gonna get amputated the hard way. Here she is doing what every ranch woman has to do and that is the work at the desk, paperwork, paperwork, paperwork. But she's got her saddle and some, looks like new set of chaps there and uh, spurs and the bridle. That must have been something she won. And so she's gonna take good care of it and not just leave it in the barn where the mice can get to it. But she was on a number of local boards in her small town that she ranched next to. She's uh, a very accomplished person. <clears throat> I never have posed any of these women for a portrait as such. I don't like to do that. I like to work with a telephoto lens and I can kind of zoom in on them at work without them being really aware that I am photographing them because I don't want people to turn, see the camera and I'm right in their personal space and I get what I call kind of a, a false smile. They're playing to the camera in many cases. This young woman was a whirling dervish of activity. She's just barely five feet tall, five foot three tall. And she was just in constant motion. She was the cow boss on this ranch in Northern Wyoming. The people who had inherited it were musicians and lived in Hollywood. So they hired Melody Harding here to run the ranch. And she certainly did. She really was, this was everything that interested her. And in particular, she loved her teams of horses. Here is a calf that when it was born, slid out of the mother's birth canal and fell headfirst 
into some uh, rough scrub uh, willows and poked an eye out. So Melody was nursing this calf, bottle feeding it uh, to make sure it would survive. A very typical thing I know when I grew up, when we had, we were calving in January and February and it was really, really cold up here in Montana. I'm talking about 35 and 45 below a couple of nights. And they would bring in my dad and my mother would bring calves into the back room of the house. In some cases, they would even put them in tepid water in the bathtub to thaw them out to keep them from freezing to death. And <clears throat> here we see Melody driving two of her beloved teams of horses. This is Miff and Muff. And uh, this is northern Wyoming, uh, not too far from a place called Big Piney. Here, she's not using a sled. This is there. She has plowed out tracks so she can run a wagon with uh, wheels and tires on it. In this case, every woman usually has to know how to run machinery. Here she's running the machinery and the hired man is positioning things a little bit and able to move out what she wants. I think in this case, she was just plowing up, moving to one side the manure in this one area so they were not, the cattle were not on top of just layers of manure, but she was getting down to where the dirt is. But she sure knew how to run that machine, I'll tell you. She's a horsewoman, too. And of course, maybe some of you know about milk and cream. Cream is lighter than milk, so it rises to the top. But <clears throat> it takes a long time to skim the cream off a bucket of milk, and you have to have some place to refrigerate those buckets of milk. It's easier to do it with a separator, cream separator. We always called it a separator. And the milk that comes out is skim milk, and the other spigot goes to the cream container. It's over here to the left and it's pouring into this glass. So, you know, there's not a great deal of milk in there or going to be very much cream. <clears throat> but Melody was there. She was wearing her chaps. They call them the full length slap chaps that you put your legs into. They call them shotguns because they look like the barrels of a shotgun when you just kind of hold them up and look at them. Just two places to put your legs in. You're well protected though, very well protected. This is the photograph that I feel I should have had on the cover of the book. It's called Hard Twist. This is clearly a woman's hand. Look at the, um, the uh, cuff of her shirt there. She's got the reins. If she should by any chance drop her reins, at least they're not gonna go to the ground. They're just gonna fall up there on the horse's neck and she can pick it up again. This rope is the old time lariat rope made of hemp and hemp is wet and then it's twisted very, very tightly and left to dry. And that's what the old timers always roped with. Today, you use nylon, it's very, very stiff. But in the earlier days before nylon, it was just this hemp and the rope would get kind of soft and it would look like it was saggy, but when you build it into a loop and start whirling it over your head, it's, uh, it's no nonsense. 
Again, this is northern New Mexico. This is one, I'll show you her sister. This woman is a lawyer and she is, she gives up the law practice and comes during the month of May to help uh, during all of the brandings there at the ranch. They rope them, drag them to the fire, as we say, vaccinate them, castrate them if it's a male, uh, earmark them, dehorn them if necessary, and brand them or ear tag them. She, her specialty was, or is, water and land rights. Now, I can't think of a better <laughs> family situation than to have a lawyer in the family on the family ranch who specializes in water and land rights. It's very important. Uh, and here's her sister, younger sister, who was responsible for the horse program at the ranch. They raised a lot of horses for racing in New Mexico, but there's not much racing anymore. It's all become um, other kinds of gambling rather than horses, rather than horse racing. And she has just fastened these tires on the side of this horse to get him used to everything. So he's not going to spook. So he's not going to buck. Uh, so he's going to be a good horse soon. Now, you've seen the two sisters. Here is a sister-in-law. She came from Georgia, I believe it was. She married the oldest boy. There were four boys and two girls. This is from the famous CS Ranch in northern New Mexico. She is a crackerjack roper. And uh, she was doing her thing there. But she also had to take time out to nurse her little girl, Sarah. And I wanted to have that in the book because this is so typical of ranch women. They're raising families. They've got to nurse the children, but they also have to be there to do the work. I mean, she was a crackerjack roper. And you have to have one or two of those at least when you're branding cattle. When you rope them as they did in the old days and drag them to the fire. Some people run them through chutes and onto a table. The table tips on its side. And then you don't have a lot of um, heavy work to do. In this case, here was a family in central New Mexico. They would, <clears throat> usually the guys were on the ground doing the wrestling, but sometimes there was a girl there and I'll show you a picture of her in just a bit. Here we have a daughter who was roping and they would get about, mm, I'd say 15 calves down. The wrestlers on the ground would tie all four legs together and then everybody get off their horses and they would go through these tied up calves like an assembly line. They would earmark them, vaccinate them, dehorn them, brand them and castrate them if it was a male calf. And then once that was all finished, they'd undo the, the uh, pig and strings, which are the short strings that tie the calves down. And the ropers would get back on their horses and they'd start it again. It was, I've never seen that before. I was fascinated by it because it was so different. And here you have a daughter-in-law. She married the son and she is undoing uh, the uh, pig and string that fastened the four legs together. And on this ranch, the mother and father, Karen and Dave Farr here, 
were just checking on the cattle. And I titled this photograph, The Good Times, because you can see that there's plenty of water in the windmill tank, so much that it's spilling over to the pond off to one side. There's good grass, the cattle look good, and the skies look good, no storms approaching. Mare's tails here, and then a few cumulus clouds over here. Just good times. And now we're up in Montana with a little bit of snow, quite a little bit of snow. This is my sister, my middle sister. And the boys had gotten the bulls out of the mountains. <laughs> so they said to us, Shelly and myself, would you girls like to go get the bulls? <laughs> this is snow and look how deep it is on the horse's ox. It's drifted. And the minute this sun drops down below the horizon, the temperature is going to drop by at least 15 degrees. It was cold. And uh, the men took the caterpillars and plowed a road up to where we were bringing the bulls out of the mountains. Do you think the bulls would follow the tracks that the caterpillar made? Oh, no. They had to drag the family jewels through the snow. I just, you know, bulls are only good for one thing. I mean, it doesn't require intelligence. Gosh. <laughs> and here is my sister, Shelly. Warmer weather. Um, People that they knew had been married on the ranch, a young couple had been married and they wanted a campfire dinner and then they wanted to ride home by moonlight. So um, Shelly and her husband, Bill, accommodated them. This is their middle son, Rocco, and uh, he's doing the steaks for them. And then they'll sit around and uh, somebody, I think it's, uh, oh, Rocco's younger brother plays a guitar and sings, so they'll have that. And then when the moon rises over here to the east, why, they will ride home by moonlight. Can't, you know, it's these little things in ranching that make it so good. Here she is. She's running a baler, baling hay on the ranch. But apparently there was something and she came back to check on it and see what was happening because you don't want your baler to break down if you can possibly help it. You have to get parts in town. You, it's just, it's too much trouble. And here we have a ranch woman. This is a family that ranched on uh, leased land, which was public land, leased from the government, and private land. They had sheep in the mountains and cattle down below. There were uh, two girls and two boys in the family. They were all horseback people. And uh, in the old days, a lot of good ranches that have cattle were built on sheep because when sheep prices are down, cattle are up. When cattle prices are down, sheep are up. Plus you get two shearings from sheep and sheep usually have twins and you don't have that with cattle. But you'll notice the rosary right around the saddle horn here. Polly Dickinson is the family name. Vermillion is the name of the ranch. And it's the corner of Wyoming, Colorado, and uh, Utah. Yes, that come together. And um, Polly said, I asked her about the rosary. Polly's a passionate Catholic. And I asked her about the rosary and she said, yes, my grandmother said she had lost 38 of those out in this kind of ranch country. This is a part of the pasturage, huge pasturage. And uh, she said her grandmother never got hurt 
on horseback. And a lot of people can be hurt if a horse goes over backwards, the saddle horn can poke into your body and damage organs. It can be, you can have some bad accidents on horseback. I have to say, I have not known personally anybody who did, any ranchers who did, but I do know of a few people that I didn't know who have had bad accidents. So Polly said she was having the rosary too. She felt it was good insurance, just to be sure. She also had a very interesting refrigerator door. <laughs> she had all of these, all of these sayings on here. And one that just tickled me no end is the one that says, saddle your horse before sassing the boss. <laughs> You, you better have your horse saddled. You don't want to have to head down the road bareback if you can help it. Uh, and then she had another uh, statement here from <laughs> uh, Churchill. Never give in. Never, never, never. And uh, there are just so many things on this that I thought, whatever it takes, but I never saw another refrigerator door. And I photographed and interviewed 50 ranch women, but we did not have that many in the book at all. But I, nobody had a refrigerator door that was covered with information like this. This is the same family. This is one of the daughters, the youngest daughter, and uh, Dee Dee. And then this is her dad, Dwight, who was a veterinarian. So they are doctoring a cow's uterus. It was called a prolapsed uterus, where the cow has kind of expelled it. And so uh, Dwight, her dad, is showing her how to treat this, how to clean it up. We'll put it back in the, in the cow's body and then sew together the lips of the birth canal so it has a chance to stay in there and um, grow back into place. It just happened when she was giving birth. Here's another little cow, little heifer. And this is one of the reasons why I use a telephoto lens, I, a zoom lens, because I can appear to move in by zooming in and I don't have to disturb this heifer who is trying to give birth. This owner, Cynthia May, has put a rope around the legs to pull the calf out. And in pulling the calf and the little heifer, she does it gently. So the little heifer is able to push and help give birth too. And the, uh, as the calf is sliding out, being pulled out, the membrane across the nose, the placenta, is being torn off so the calf can breathe. Mm -hmm. And this one I call double duty. This is a woman, it's a shipping day. She helped gather cattle before, well, just pre-dawn. You can see her shafts, her spurs back there and her hat. And she was, after they gathered all the cattle, the trucks came to pick them up. The stock inspector was there. The neighbors were there, the hired hands were there, the family was there to all do the work. And uh, Jane Kane, this is Southern New Mexico, Jane Kane was helping to move the cattle into the chutes to be or onto the scales, I should say, so they could be weighed. And she was checking on lunch for everybody, which was, among other things, good brisket. Really good. They know how to do it down there. And here is a part of the corrals. Look at this land. 
They ranch in an area of New Mexico called the Jornada del Muerto, the journey of death. And look at it, there's virtually no water. They had to put in uh, windmills and wells. That's what I climbed up on in order to be able to look down and make a photograph. This is Jane on her horse. And there are some of the other horses here and the men down there. And these are railroad ties that appear to be, um, I think they're just railroad ties. They might've been split, but believe you me, they have so much creosote in them, they're not gonna decay ever, ever. It's pretty dry though. <clears throat> And here is an interesting woman from uh, Nevada. Just a little bit of a woman. She's with one of her um, registered bulls. She had registered Herefords and she had commercial Herefords. She uh, and her husband was an old time uh, filly chaser just rounding up wild horses to gather them up and then corral them and sell them in the old days before they tried to keep them uh, on some wild horse um, facilities in the United States. Personally, I think they ought to open the um, slaughterhouses to, uh, for horses in the United States. They've closed them. Um, and consequently, these horses are ending up going to Canada and Mexico, Mexico being the very worst um, of places for slaughtering horses. At any rate, Molly was a very gifted woman. She wrote a couple of books about her area where she ranched in uh, Nevada called Grass Valley. It was quite a high elevation. And uh, we, I was there and she had loaded her horse, Timmy, and then her dog, Chica. Timmy just would hop into the back of the pickup, as you can see this is. And she would haul him around to the fields where she wanted to gather cattle. And she was going to do that for me so I could photograph her. Well, I saw her with Timmy and the land was eroded kind of in fingers, very deep spots. You couldn't ride around it because it took so much time. You had to drop into those eroded way spaces and then out on the other side. And I saw her go down into one at a trot and then I saw a splash of dust and then nothing. So I hopped in the truck and tried to drive around. I could see where Timmy was standing. So he was just waiting there. So I drove over there and sure enough, there'd been an accident. He had stepped into a gopher hole or a badger hole fallen down, he threw Molly over him, and then he fell on top of her. She couldn't have weighed more than probably 90 pounds or 98 pounds soaking wet. So she was pretty fragile too. She was 68 at that time, which is young, I think. And um, so I had a friend with me and I had her stay with Molly. I took everything we could find to cover her because this was a high elevation. It was a grass valley. <clears throat> and the minute the sun went behind the mountains, it was going to get really, really cold. Molly had asked me to help her sit up. And I said, oh, Molly, I don't want to. And she said, do it right now, I want to sit up. So I lifted her very slowly and she said, oh, I can't stand that, let me lie down. Well, I go back to the ranch uh, and told the cook 
what had happened. I said, we have to call for an ambulance because she's got to have one. It took three hours for the ambulance to get there. They took her to the nearest town, uh, Austin, and flew her to the hospital in Reno. And then I drove in there, Reno, to find out what had happened to her. Well, apparently when he fell, when Timmy fell on her, it squeezed her liver like you might squeeze a grape and it just popped. And she also had two broken ribs. And she was in the hospital for, I think, a week. And that's when they kept you in hospitals a little bit longer. Then we stayed in, in contact. She's a very well-educated woman. And she really uh, cared a great deal about raising registered Herefords. And then the commercial Herefords were there primarily for to make money on the ranch. And we stayed in contact. Then she developed macular degeneration. And at that time, they had no treatment for it. So she lost her vision. Then her husband, the wild horse chaser, he developed macular degeneration and also lost his vision. They had to sell the ranch, move to Reno. And I think they both just, when they had to sell the ranch, they, it just killed something inside them. And Molly just thought, well, it's time to quit. You know, give it up now. And <clears throat> I am working on a process where I am photographing by only the light of the moon. And that requires exposures of about 12 and a half seconds right now. And you can see the stars. You can see the mountains back here, my range. This happens to be one of my horses, Miercules. And this is a friend who tried to buy him from me, but I don't sell horses. I would sell photographs, but I don't sell horses. That's like family. You can't do that. And with that, I'm going to close. So I hope you might have some questions for me.